I'm excited to chat with Brad Walsh today on the Awaken Feminine podcast. Brad is first and foremost a father to two beautiful girls aged 21 and 23, a husband to an amazing, inspiring woman, a photographer, and a podcast host and producer who found himself wanting to inspire others during the pandemic. He birthed the idea of Empowerography as a platform to highlight strong, inspired, and dynamic women to share their stories of success, triumph, resiliency, and transformation to empower, elevate, and educate by amplifying the voices of women all over the world. And I know he has so much love and wisdom to share with us today. He's joining me all the way from Canada. Welcome to the show, Brad. Hello, Kaki. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here on your platform and spend the time with you and chat and share a little bit about who I am and and the work that I'm doing. I'm truly honored and thank you. I appreciate you. Oh, I'm so excited because um, I met you through a group and I, then we had a chat and I was like, oh my gosh, we need to get Brad's message out there <laughs> more because you're just truly amazing. And you're my second male guest. So I don't usually wow. have many male guests on, usually mostly females. So when I have a male guest, they really <laughs> have to like <laughs> be amazing. Move to you, be on. Yes. Well, Definitely. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored. Wow. So, I'm truly honored. Thank you. Yes. I'm really excited. Um, I usually ask my female guests what their definition of awakened feminine is, but what I want to know from you is when I say the term awakened feminine, mm-hmm. what does it like insight in you, like in terms of feelings of what, what, ma- what does it make you think about? Awakened feminine makes me think about a woman who has fully stepped into her authenticity, fully stepped into her power and owned it. She, she owns her authentic voice. That's what that means to me. She's fully, fully aware, very, very self-aware and just owns, owns everything that she is. That's beautiful. Thank you for that, Fred. Mm -hmm. Now I really love to dive into, you know, more about who you are and what you do. Can you share with us why you decided to empower women, you know, as a man, you know, most, most of the time when we think of men, we don't think of them as, you know, really, you know, their mission being to empower women. What yeah. made you decide to do that? Well, it, it goes back quite a ways. Um, I started off my entrepreneurial journey as a photographer and I jumped into photography Um, I never wanted to photograph people. I had no interest and my, my, my genre or my type of photography I wanted to shoot was architecture, landscapes and things like that. Um, I have two daughters. They are aged now. They are now aged, as you mentioned off the top, they're now aged 21 and 23. They are a huge part of my inspiration for all that I do with the podcast and the photography. And a big part of that reason being is both girls were bullied as kids in elementary school, my youngest was bullied by both boys and girls verbally and physically. And my oldest was bullied by girls verbally. And to see the girls have to go through that was heartbreaking. Of course, as a parent, you know this, how, mm. how terrible this, something like that would be. But I think the worst part of it was seeing the effects that it had on the girls carry through with them to the different stages of their lives from elementary school to high school to now their young adult lives. And it it breaks my heart when I step back, of course, because they're my kids, but stepping back and taking a a wider look at the whole situation, the fact that there are hundreds of millions of young girls and women who go through that kind of thing and deal with it on a daily basis and have it affect how they view themselves, that they don't love themselves, they don't feel confident in who they are, they don't feel confident in their abilities. To me, that's heartbreaking. So I ventured into a genre of photography called boudoir photography, which is geared at helping to instill self-confidence, um, body acceptance, self-love, all of those things. And the girls and my wife, my mother, my, my grandma, they are a big part of that inspiration for getting into that genre of photography. Because I, I think that I don't think any woman should have to feel like that or go through any of that. So then fast forward, I mean, I did that. I, I worked in a corporate job for 12 and a half years. And when I left that job, I jumped into photography full time. And I was doing this for, I had been doing this for, I've had my business now for 12 years, seven years part-time and five years full. 
And once I made the jump into full-time photography, that was my focus, that genre of photography. And then of course we, we got hit with the pandemic and Mm. that basically rendered my business inoperable. Now I had already started the podcast in 2019 but I only did about seven or eight interviews with friends of mine who were photographers and makeup artists just to get the platform up off the ground and and going. And then COVID struck, which of course, as I mentioned, rendered my business inoperable. And so I I just, I didn't want to fall into the negativity of everything that was going on in the world. I didn't want to be sucked into that negativity. And I thought this is the perfect opportunity where I can use this time that we've all been given to do something positive in the world, put something good out there instead of sitting around complaining about what was going on in the world. And so I thought I'll reignite the podcast. I can put all of my energy and all of my focus into that. So I began reaching out to women on Instagram and explaining what my idea was behind the platform and what I wanted to do with it. And honestly, Kaki, the women were, the response was so incredibly overwhelming. Women were so happy to hear that a man had started a platform like this and wanted to, to provide this space and, and help elevate women and amplify their voices and share their stories through this platform. So it just turned into this thing where the women I was interviewing were were telling me, Brad, I've got someone who you can interview. Brad, I have a friend who'd be great for your platform. And it's grown into this beautiful community now to where the podcast doesn't even belong to me anymore. It's not even mine. It belongs to the community. It's everybody's. And I just, I love every bit of this. I can tell you with all of my heart and soul, every fiber of my being that I have found my purpose and my mission in life. And that is this platform to help elevate women and amplify their voices and share their stories and get the word out there about what they're doing. And there was part of me that when I reignited the podcast that thought, you know, be prepared, you may get pushback from women saying, well, who's this guy think he is talking about women's empowerment. What the hell does he know about that? And sure. Fair enough. I mean, I could never, ever understand what women have had to deal with and go through in life in terms of, being kept down and and not being able to not given their their due in in the working world and all of that because of men so mm-hmm. no i could never understand that but i do have a bit of an idea having helped my help my wife raise our two daughters and when i was a kid my mom left my biological father when i was 10 years old he was running around on her having an affair and back in those days of course the women were the ones who stayed home to raise the children while the husband was the one out working to make the money to support the family so Looking back on that now, the fact that my mom had the strength and the courage and the resilience to stand up and say, no, I'm not putting up with this anymore. I'm taking my boys and we're leaving. And that's exactly what we did. We left with nothing but the clothes on our back. We moved into a one bedroom apartment. My mom had to reintegrate back into the working world and get a job after being out of work for over 10 years because she stayed home to raise us. And when she was at work, my grandmother would step in and help raise us. So for me, those two women they're the foundation for all of it. They started this whole thing really way back when. Um, so really all that I do is my way of giving back to women and saying thank you for what these five women in my life have done for me and brought to my life and shared and taught me and given me. That's why I do what I do. It's these five women. They're the inspiration behind all of it. I just love your story so much. I, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I remember when I first spoke to you and you told me your story and I was just like crying because it's such a beautiful <laughs> story um, to, you know, grow and, you know, you're just surrounded by women. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way it's been all my life. Um, yeah, so it's, um, and it's beautiful that, you know, you're, you're I guess, stepping up to fight for um, our, our right, not rights, but like, you know, our voices yeah, and well, I th- our stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's our responsibility as men to finally take a stand and stand up and, and stand beside our women shoulder to shoulder and show and tell them that we're here. We support you. We hear you which of course is important because when you think about it, really, that's all anybody wants is to be heard. So yeah, we stand beside you. We support you. We, we, we want to empower you or help empower you. We want to elevate you and let you know that we are allies. We're here to support you. So I think it's our responsibility as men and we need more men on board doing this. Yes, definitely. And so far I haven't seen many men that has a mission really to empower women. So there's um, far and few, but, you know, just meeting you has given me hope that, you know, it's changing. I want to ask you, um, 
since you started this journey, mm-hmm. how has, um, I guess, how has your family felt about it? I want to know like their, <laughs> you know, how they feel and their, how inspired they are by you. Yeah, they're, they're very proud. They're, they are inspired. And I mean, something that my wife and I always, always told our girls from when they were very young is that they can do anything they want in life. Don't let, don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't do anything because you can. And it's my belief that we as parents, again, I think this is our responsibility as parents to instill these values into our children from a very young age so that they just grow up knowing that, yes, I can do anything because my parents said I can, and they've instilled those values. And I mean, that's not to say you could sit around and everything's going to happen for you. You have to put in the work. You have to believe in yourself. You have to love yourself. All of it. We've instilled all these values in our kids since they were very young. So I think it's just a natural thing that, because I believe that if someone's told something enough, they believe it. Mm -hmm. it, it, That can also work in a negative way. If you're told negative things all the time, you're going to start believing it. So I just think that we need to instill these values into our kids. And so they see me doing things that I never, I never even thought I could do. Like I never in a million years dreamed I'd be doing what I'm doing now. And so, yeah, they're, they're very proud and inspired and happy to see me doing what I'm doing. I mean, when I was working in corporate, for the first five or six years, I was happy. I loved my job. But the last five or six years, I was miserable. I could not, I hated going to work. I hated get up, getting up in the morning and going to work. And I wasn't, I was not a happy person. Mm-hmm. So for them to see this change, they love it. They think it's great. Yeah. How was that transition for you going from working in corporate to then owning your own business? Did you find it a uh, rather smooth because I know you went part-time and then full-time into your business so how did you find that transition for you it was scary as hell it was really scary I mean making that jump into full-time you don't have that safety net anymore you don't Mm -hmm. have benefits you don't have that constant steady money coming in that you do with a corporate job so it was scary as hell I can remember about a month before I decided, my wife and I had talked about it and we decided, okay, you know what, Brad, she said to me, she said, I don't want to see you miserable anymore. So let's just do it. Let's just Mm. do it. So for a month before I gave my notice every morning on the subway, on the way to work, my stomach was in knots thinking about the fact that, oh my gosh, I'm leaving. Like I got to give my notice. And it was, it was, it was a tough, tough build up to that. And then when I handed that notice in, there were times where I thought, Oh my, cause I gave them a month's notice. I thought, mm. Oh man, did I do the right thing? And I also, of course you have external noise chirping in your ear, people saying, well, you're, you're jumping into photography. There's so many photographers out there. What are you thinking? You're leaving a full-time job, the benefits, all this. So it was tough. It was a very tough transition. I think that's tough for anybody. Most people, I think making the jump from full-time stability mm-hmm. into the unknown world of entrepreneurship. But now, I mean, when I look back on that, cause it's been, it's five years this year. When I look back on that, it's like, I couldn't see myself ever working for somebody else ever again. Mm-hmm. There's no yeah. way it's just it, the, the freedom and the ability to do whatever the hell you want. And, I mean, it is honestly, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. It, yeah. it, it's a tough battle. It's a roller coaster ride, but the rewards I, to me anyways, are so worth it. It, yeah. it's, it's an incredible feeling to be able to do what you want to do, do what makes you happy, do what makes your soul sing and make money at it. There's no better feeling. It's incredible. And when that, when that purpose or that job you have, or that business you're running has impact, that's like winning the lottery twice. Honestly, I love it. I love that. And I totally agree. I think definitely not for everyone, but once you, if it is for you and once you've started doing it, you really just can't go back to working for someone else. Yeah. I mean, it takes a while to get your footing. It took me a couple of, the first couple of years were pretty rough for me in, in here in, mm. with the mindset piece. Cause I was in a competition mindset. I was always thinking about what other photographers are doing and why am I not where this person is yet? And yeah. you cannot get caught up in that because you'll, you'll sink yourself. It's, you just can't, you have to, 
you have to shift that mindset. And it took me two years, almost two years to shift that mindset. But I'm telling you, once I shifted that mindset, my whole world changed. Everything opened up. I started getting more inquiries. I started getting more bookings. Everything shifted. Yeah. Can you pinpoint when your mind, like what you were doing that changed your mindset? Um, it was probably through converse. Yeah. It was probably conversations that I was having with different friends around that time. It was about the year. And I would say about a year and a half into my entrepreneurial journey and just talking with different people. I had different mentors that were photographers and I guess through conversations with them. Um, and then I just, it's just something clicked inside. It's like, no, Brad, the only competition you have is you. Mm. And I've always kept that in my head. And from that, from that day forward that the only competition I have is me. As long as I can look back on how far I've come, I can look back on, on my work as a photographer. I can look back on what I'm doing now. As long as I can see that I've improved, that I have improved from where I, where I began to where I am now, that's all that matters to me. That's my only competition is me. That's it. Yeah, totally agree. But I think as a society, we're just always we've been programmed to have this mindset of competing that there's not yes. enough yeah. and it takes a while to really understand that there's like infinite amount of resources oh, absolutely, and there's enough absolutely. for everyone. So yeah. yeah. I love See, that. you hear that all the time, right? Is, Oh, like I said, when I first was thinking about making the jump, people were like, you're, you're leaving corporate, you're leaving stability to be a photographer. There's so many out there. Yeah. But no one else is me. No mm-hmm. other photographer shoots the way I do. No other photographer has my eye. So no other photographer treats their clients the way I do. That's the mindset you have to get into. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's tough though. It's tough. Oh yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> totally know, you're understand. You're an entrepreneur as well. You know. Yeah, totally understand. But there's only one Brad and there's only one Kaki. So that's right. Yeah. That's right. Even if we do exactly the same thing, it's, that's right. We have different clientele. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, there are going to be people out there who aren't going to resonate with who you are or the work you do. And that's okay. You have to, you also have to get into that mindset as well. Not everybody is for you and Mm -hmm. that's okay. Your vibe will attract your tribe. You'll find your people and your people will find you. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that was a hard one for me. Yeah, me to too. go, not everyone's going to like me. I, yeah. You know, I grew up being a people pleaser and wanting everyone to like me and That's to it. have that go. Whew, <laughs> it yeah, it, it's a tough one for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but did you not notice a difference once you did get into that mindset that things yeah. changed for you? Such a big difference yeah. because you just go, you know, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. That's it. That's what you have to do. Otherwise you will end up down a very dark, deep rabbit hole. And that's good for nobody, especially you. Yeah. And when you think about it, uh, being choosing who your clients are is also important because I don't want to be working with someone that doesn't resonate with me and our energy is completely, you know, not aligned. It makes a very hard working relationship. For sure. Yeah. And that's another, that's another benefit of being an entrepreneur is you have the ability to choose who you want to work with. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I want to ask you, cause you were saying that you only wanted to take architectural photography. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you started your business, like how long were you in the architectural p- photography and when did you switch to doing the boudoir? Well, I had start even when I was working full time, and I was building my business part-time. I was, I was shooting the architectural stuff and I would create my art and I would take it around and, and show an exhibit at art shows around Toronto. And I did that for a while. I would say the first year or so I was still doing some of that. But at that same time, when I left my corporate job, I had the opportunity actually to be the headshot photographer because that's what that was part of my job when I was working at the accounting firm is I did headshots for the firm Mm -hmm. but when I left because they didn't have a photographer anymore to do the headshots they brought me on as my business to do the headshots so I I I had 
my business started off great because I had that opportunity to come back and I was making money. But at that same time, I was also doing the boudoir. So it was immediately, I was shoot, mm-hmm. I was doing a bit of everything. I was doing the art stuff. I was doing headshots and I was doing the boudoir work as well. So it was a mix of everything. Yeah. I want to ask you, this just popped into my head, like as a man doing boudoir mm-hmm. photography, mm-hmm. obviously you have to, make the, your clients most yeah I would say that yeah. they're mostly women <laughs> yes <laughs> comfortable you know as a male mm-hmm. photographer how did you find that and what's your you know special like brag <laughs> technique to make women comfortable <laughs> doing boudoir photography <laughs> um well I think it, it was it was fine I didn't have any problems with it I I had for the last six years of my corporate job, I was practicing and honing my skills, lighting, posing, all of that stuff. So I was establishing contacts as well while I was shooting. I was doing shoots for free while mm-hmm. I was working because I wanted to, to enhance and, and hone my skills. Um, but it, 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 it wasn't hard. I mean, yeah, it's, it's different. Let's be honest, boudoir photography is a female dominated industry for sure. Um, but there are, obviously there are males out there doing it. I think that the way I do things is it's, it's paramount for me to establish trust right from the point of contact, because think about it. These women are in a very vulnerable state when they're coming into the studio, they're basically, I'm photographing them in their underwear and bra, right? So Mm -hmm. trust is incredibly important. So right from the point of contact, when I get an email in saying they're interested in booking a shoot with me, Obviously they know I'm a male, so they're uh, comfortable with that to begin with. Mm. But what I do is I have a process where they contact me. I set up a time to hop on a phone call or a zoom call, whatever the case may be with them. And I have a, uh, it's called a pre-shoot pre-shoot consult where I have a questionnaire that I sit down and we go through the questions. I ask them all sorts of different things. Why do you want to do a boudoir shoot? Um, all different things. Uh, what inspired them to want to do this. But I think that one of the things which I find is that I differentiate myself from other photographers is I talk to them about, first of all, why they want to do it. And a lot of the time women will tell me that they are doing it for their partner, for their husband, for their wife. And right there for me, something goes off and it's like, no, 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 let's, let's look at this. This, this session is about the experience. It's not about the images. The images are a byproduct of the experience. Mm. So I want you to shift your mindset a little bit and realize that this is for you. This is not for your husband. This is not for your wife, your partner. This experience is for you. Yes. You can gift the images to your partner. Your partner can enjoy the images, all of the rest, but this is about you. First and foremost, this experience is about you. Secondly, I let them know that because for a lot of people, lingerie is synonymous with boudoir. That's Mm. the first thing they think of. I have to stand around in my underwear and let this person photograph me. I let them know that that is not a requirement. You don't have to wear lingerie. You can wear whatever makes you feel beautiful, whatever makes you feel empowered, whatever makes you feel strong. Mm-hmm. So if you, if that's cut off jean shorts and a tank top, great, let's do it. We'll photograph you in that. I don't care, but it's not a, it's not a requirement. You don't have to wear that. So these few things, um, letting them know that this is about you, letting them know that this is about the experience. I think those are important pieces in building that trust. And I also let them know that you can contact me at any time between now and your shoot. If you have questions, if you want to talk, if you're feeling nervous, but call me, we'll talk about it. I will help you through this whole process. Then when they come into the studio, I want to keep it light, keep it happy and fun. And so I have my makeup artist there with me. She's helping them. She helps me out. Um, she gets them ready for their shoot. And then during the shoot, I'm constantly interacting with them, talking to them because there will be some photographers who will book a shoot and they won't even communicate with their client. And right. I'm sure the client is left wondering, well, am I doing this right? Am I, cause they've never done half of them have never done this before. So mm. they're, I'm sure they're wondering, well, are, are we getting anything good? Is there, is there good? So I'm constantly showing my clients the back of the camera to show them what we're capturing, keep them engaged, keep them happy, keep it light, keep them engaged, keep them interested. That those are all key things that I found have helped me 
being a male photographer, establish that level of trust and keep that rapport going with my clients. That's beautiful. The, when the your clients actually see the final product, mm. how do you feel seeing their reaction? Oh my gosh, Kaki, it is one of the most incredible things because I get, I mean, during the session, I get to witness transformation. Let's, let's start with that. The fact that they're coming in to see me and they're nervous to begin with, right? They're again, they're standing around in their underwear bra in front of a stranger. So Mm. there's that and getting, getting over that part of it and establishing that, that comfortability and that trust and all of the rest. But there've been times where, or I've had clients who by the end of the shoot are telling me, uh, I'll say, okay, we've got enough images. We're done. Well, we can wrap this up now. Oh, I was just getting into this. This is really fun. <laughs> so it, it's a, it's it, to witness that transformation. And then the viewing session, when I set up the viewing sessions with them and they come in, I've had women tell me that they can't believe that that's them in the photographs. And that right there is the epitome of why I do it. That's everything right there. That speaks volumes to me to, to know that I've had that kind of impact on another human being and given them that kind of gift that they see themselves in a light that they don't normally get to see themselves in. Mm. And it's like, they, it's, it's like they, they're seeing themselves for the first time. It is, is unbelievable. It is such a gift to be able to do that for people and to witness that happen. It's just, there's not enough words to describe it. Honestly, it's, it's one of the most beautiful things to ever witness in the world. Yeah. I'm, I'm now very interested in getting a boudoir photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I honestly, I have to say, I believe that every woman should experience it at least once in their life. Mm-hmm. You have to, it is from what women have told me, it is such an incredibly powerful and empowering experience. Mm. Wow. Are you going back to doing any photography or you just No, I don't have any plans to right now. I'm focusing on the podcast platform and I I think I'm actually going to be shifting away from boudoir photography into something else that I'm dreaming up in my head. It's going to be a different type of Mm -hmm. um, photography sessions and things like that. I'm calling it the empowerment sessions and and this vision of just all black and white images, not shooting color, color anymore, just shooting black and white and just capturing women in their pure raw essence. Wow. No more boudoir, no more lingerie, just women in their essence and capturing that in black and white. So that's where I'm thinking of going with it now. But for now, I'm going to focus on the podcast. Yeah. Well, that sounds really exciting. Now yeah. with your podcast, I want to ask yeah. you, um, you know, obviously you've got your community of guests that, yeah. you know, listen to that have been on your podcast in terms of like getting um, feedback from listeners, yeah. how, like, how has, have you had any, and what, what are usually the reactions for women listening to a man, man interviewing women and empowering women? That's a tough one. Um, because as you know, being a podcast host, we, there's, yes, there's statistics to show you who yeah. listens and, but there's no real measurable metrics, right? The only way we really know if what we're doing is having the impact is through conversation with people who mm. listen to the podcast. So yeah there've been a lot of times where I've wondered, am, am, is what I'm doing having any impact? Is anyone even listening? Is anyone getting anything out of this? And then out of the blue, the universe steps in and sends me messages from, from women who have been listening to the podcast. And it's all been very, very positive. Women love that a man that I'm hosting this platform and I'll get those messages. Tell them, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. It is making a difference. It is having an impact. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you for having this guest on it's, it's just, it's, it's so funny the way things work because there will be stretches where I'll go through and crickets. I don't hear anything from anybody. Mm. And then when I start thinking about it and getting it, getting my own head, cause we all do it and wonder again, is this having any impact? Am I reaching people? Something will happen and I'll get a message or I'll get a couple of messages saying, Brad, keep doing what you're doing. What you're doing is amazing work. So those are the kinds of messages I get telling me that it's amazing work and they love that I'm doing this and they love the certain guests. They, this 
this podcast really had impact. And so, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to hear those messages and to know that it is reaching people and it is having an impact. Yeah. Um, I totally understand where you're coming from because yeah. I'm the same. You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. I'm listening. And then I'm like, yeah. oh, I know people are listening because I see the stats, but there's yeah. like, you know, but um, yeah. But is it resonating, right? Yeah. That's, that's what you want to know. And I think one time, because I was like, oh, is anyone listening? And then um, <laughs> one of the school mums said to me, oh, yeah. I listened to your episode about this, this. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, you're so good. I'm like, oh, cool. All right. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. But yeah, you just exactly. don't know, do you? Yeah, and, um, exactly. Yeah, it's nice when you get those messages. It is for sure. Yeah. I want to ask you, as a man, because yep. um, men typically are um, I'm trying to figure out the word here. I just have a complete blank. When you think of a man, usually you think, okay, um, very tough, masculine, mm-hmm. don't show emotions, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the stereotypical yeah. yes. macho the type yeah. thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And um, growing up in a house, you know, with of women and now yep. also establishing a family where yeah. you're with all women, yeah. How do you like, you know, are you someone that's quite sensitive or are you like, you know, do you, are you okay with displaying the feminine side of you? I think that's yeah. what I'm trying to Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, I am. I'm, I mean, being raised by two women, my mom and my grandmother, I mean, I was taught because you mentioned the, the, this whole macho thing where boys, and I think this needs to shift as well. Boys are conditioned, grow up conditioned to, as you said, Oh, you can't show emotion. Mm. Don't cry. You're acting like a little girl and all of that stuff. I think that needs to shift because boys, men need to realize that it's okay to show emotion. We are human beings. We have emotions. You cannot, I mean, yes, you can turn them off, but we shouldn't turn them off. It's okay to have those emotions and it's okay to display them and show them. So being raised around women, I was taught that it's okay to show emotion. It's okay to cry. If something's hurting you, something's bothering you, talk about it. Let me, that was one thing that my mom and grandmother always encouraged. If you've got something on your mind, if something's bothering you, come to us, you can talk to us. And that was always encouraged from the time I was a little kid. Even now, my mom will say, Hey, listen, if you need to talk, I'm here. Right. So I think it's important that we teach our boys from young, again, going back to this whole thing where if we instill values into our children from a young age, they don't, they grow up not knowing any different. So I think for, for us as parents, parents of boys, we need to instill into our boys that you don't have to put on this macho bullshit facade. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to show your emotions. It's okay to cry. I think Mm. that's very important and we need to do more of that. So Yeah, that's just how I was raised. So yeah, I I show emotions. And I mean, I wouldn't say I go around crying. (laughs) You know, I mean, yeah, it just, but you're comfortable. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, I I don't, I don't care what people think. If, if you're going to laugh at me because I'm upset or I'm showing emotion or I'm crying, see you later. I I don't have time for that. Mm. Did you find yourself growing up to, um, you know, did you have any trouble with interacting with like your male counterparts because you may be more sensitive or you are able to express your emotions, whereas they might not be able to express their emotions? I'm just Um, interested, really interested in. (laughs) No, I didn't have any problem interacting with my friends, male friends or anything like that. Um, No, that wasn't an issue at all. I mean, I just was, I didn't know any different. This is who I am. This is how I was raised. Mm. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Right. I mean, Mm. I was bullied as a kid, but um, other than that, no, I didn't have any problems showing emotion or anything like interacting with my friends. It was, Mm. yeah, I am who I am. That's good. Like, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, you just attract people that, uh, you know, aligned with yourself anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Do you so, think we do that even from a young age, though? Even when we're kids? Mm, no, but I think you, if you're generally a good person, I think you do attract good people into your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I find, I don't know, um, I've never had problems with friends. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's just 
how it was, but yeah, like actually seeing my daughter now, um, she's six, right? And already I'm just like, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to navigate her going to teenage <laughs> years because there's all I don't know, maybe it's a girl's thing where they already have the like bitchiness going on some of them sure, and yeah it, it just I'm just like oh my goodness there are only six how how we <laughs> get through yeah, to those, teenage those teen years yeah those are tough and I have to say boys don't don't behave yeah. in that way like boys if boys get into it with each other or they disagree with each other or they argue with each other they argue they have it out and then it's done and then yeah. they're friends again it's whereas girls they're not like that at all it's complete opposite they hold yeah. grudges and they carry that shit around with them so it's very different to see that so again being the father of two girls i saw a lot of that shit i mean the girls were bullied as kids so i saw all of that where i just sometimes i would just throw my hands up and think what the hell is wrong with these kids? Like y- mm. your kids just get, get over it. It's done. Just get back yeah. to what you were, you know, it's, it's so bizarre. Yeah. I don't even know where they would pick it up from, like from yeah, such a young know. age, it really baffles me. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, my daughter, actually my daughter says to me, I prefer playing with the boys because the boys, <laughs> yeah, she said that she's like, because the boys don't go. have all this, like all this stuff. That's where- it. Yeah. Yeah. So she actually gets along really well with, you know, the boys in her class. And when she's sick of playing with the girls and, you know, all the crap that goes on, <laughs> then she goes off to play with the boys. But then I love it. But then again, like the boys sometimes don't want to play with the girls. So, yeah, you know, so course. sometimes she's a bit like, oh, I didn't have anyone I'm, to play I'm with. Stuck. What I- yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's, it is a bit hard. But um yeah, because I never had any problems growing up. So it's um quite interesting and also a bit scary watching her yeah. navigate. Um, and I try my best to guide her. Yeah. yeah. That's all we can do as parents, though. I mean, you just have to give them the tools and be there to support when when things go sideways or things like that, like you just mentioned, happen with your daughter, where she's wants to play with the boys instead of the girls and the boys don't want to play with her. We just have to be there to support them and get them through it, guide them through it and keep them going. Right. Yeah. I want to ask you, you were bullied as a child and then your daughters were bullied Mm -hmm. as well through school. Mm -hmm. So you obviously would have a deep understanding of what they were going Mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I, you know, I'm ignorant. I don't know about being bullied. Um, yeah. How how were you able to help your girls get through those, t- you know, tough times? Um, and I know as teenagers, you know, we don't tend to like to, not that we don't listen to our parents, but there's always the. No, we, oh. don't, we don't. We don't. <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, come on. I, yeah. can, I can think of times growing up where my parents would be telling me stuff as a teenager. But I'd be thinking in my head, yeah, yeah, whatever. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You have no clue. But then as we get older yeah. and into our 20s and 30s, like, man, they were right. They did know what the hell they're talking about because they've been through it already. Yeah. Maybe not the exact situation, but they've been through stuff. They know. They really do know what the hell's going on. Yeah. And so when I look at my situation now as a parent, I'm sure the girls were saying the same things. Like, who the hell's this? Be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I've been through it. So I think just being able to draw on that experience of being bullied was, was helpful um, because I, I had an idea I could relate. Now, of course, our situations are very different. But I have, there's the relatability factor there because I was bullied as well. So we just, both of us, my wife and I kept reiterating to the girls that don't let that get into your head. Don't let these people tell you that you're less than. Don't let them tell you that you're not good enough. Don't let them. And you have to stand up for yourself. And now I'm not saying turn around and punch the person in the mouth, but you have to stand up for yourself. You have to. As hard as it is at times, you have to, right? Um, I can remember it got to a point where the girls where we thought, okay, and and of course, all the schools nowadays have these no bullying policies, mm. which I think is complete bullshit. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So it got to the point with the girls where my wife and I had had enough. They were coming home upset every day and it, it was just so much. So we thought, okay, let's we're going to sit down with the principal 
So we set a meeting with the principal and <laughs> it came time for the meeting. My wife and I went in and I'm very, compared to my wife, usually I'm a very laid back, quiet, chill, mm. relaxed. So we went into the meeting and we're talking about what was going on and how displeased we were with the situation. My wife's Italian, so she's hot headed to begin with. Right? <laughs> um, and so the principal is coming back saying, well, you know, this boy, come, we're dealing with my youngest situation in particular. She was being um, physically abused and mentally abused, verbally abused, sorry, yeah. by a boy. And the principal started making excuses saying, well, the boy comes from a bad home and, you know, we have to be understanding and so and i lost it i just, i had had enough of listening to all of this crap and I, about this no bullying policy and i just i went off the rails i saw red mm -hmm. and i probably could have controlled myself a lot better than i did i was swearing i was really really upset yeah. and my wife i can remember looking over at my wife and she had this look on her face of sheer terror she's like who the hell is this guy? This is not Brad. This is not my husband. What the hell? Where's Brad? And what have you done with him? And so we got through the meeting later on. I found out that the principal told my wife, don't ever bring your husband to another meeting with you again. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot imagine you. Oh, well. The sweetest person. I, I know. <laughs> but it's just, uh, you know, I mean, we, we just have to keep instilling in our kids. Again, it goes back to this instilling these values and let them know that you've got to stand up for yourself and instill those values of confidence and keep reiterating that to them mm -hmm. so that they know no different. That, that is one of the most important things to me as a, as a parent, that's, that's something that we have to do to help our kids get through things like this. And you just have to be there. You have to listen, actively yeah. listen when your kids talk. Yeah. watch for the signs, pay attention. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. I make it a point to have a conversation about the school day with my daughter. I mean, she's yeah. six, but I no, just, but still, yeah. And then I actually find out things about her friends there and what they go. say. And yeah, I just had a situation where she was telling me about her friend that she played with saying, all these things about herself. And I was like, do I tell the parent or not? Yeah. It's a tough thing, right? Yeah. And just so she messaged me that day and I went, Oh, you know, I mm -hmm. and I think as a parent, if my, if my child was saying things about herself, like I'm a bad person and things yeah. like that, I would want someone to tell me about yes. it. So I, I did. And yeah, so she, it was, you know, um, she was like, oh, thank you for telling me. But yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's hard being a parent. And especially when the situations, you know, things aren't smooth, it makes it yeah. even harder. It's, it's the toughest job in the world. The yeah. absolute toughest. There's no job. Any, I mean, we don't, we don't get a manual telling us how to raise kids or what to do. And it, it's, it's trial and error. And of course we, we learn from our parents. If the situations were good, of course, yeah. with our parents, we take those, some of those things with us, but basically it's, it's trial and error. You, it's learn on the job kind of thing, right? It's, it's tough. Yeah. And I think we just need to stop beating ourselves up when we don't yes. do such a good job because we're still like you're saying trial and erroring. Yeah. Well, we're human beings. I mean, we figure things out as we go and we have to be gentle with ourselves for sure. We're going to make mistakes. We're humans. That's mm. just part of life. Right. But we yeah. have to be gentle with ourselves and give ourselves grace around those things when they do happen, because they will happen. It's inevitable. Yeah. Do you find like w between you and your wife, like mm -hmm. um, which one of you would beat yourself up more than the other? Because I know as women, we tend wife, to do, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, absolutely. She's, she's more easygoing than me in terms of discipline and things like that, where yeah. I'm, I'm the disciplinarian one. She's, yeah. she'd rather just, I'll oh, just let it go. It's okay. It's a, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not willing to die on that hill kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And um, I want to ask you in terms of like, empowering women mm -hmm. 
around, uh, you know, in your life, how, 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 with you doing your podcast and like, you know, um, has, has your daughters, you know, has it impacted your daughters in any way? Have you seen any changes with them? Are they actually, are they fans of your podcast? Do they even listen? I don't <laughs> they, know. They don't even, no, no, they don't even listen. No, I actually, though, I do want to, and I've been saying this for a while now, and I really just have to make it happen. I do want to get the girls on to interview me on the podcast. I think that would be a fun episode to have them on and interview me. And they did say that they would do it, but I have to create the questions for them. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So I will do that eventually. I would really love to get that done. And I'd also like to have my wife on as a guest as well. Oh, that'd so, be beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'll make those episodes so, happen. I have to do that sooner rather than later. I've been putting it off and putting it off. So I have yeah. to get around to doing that for sure. Yeah. And in terms of the guests that you've had like so far, how many guests have you interviewed so far on your podcast? Well, today I will be, I haven't published today's episode yet. So I publish twice a week, Mondays and Fridays. Um, today I will be publishing my 316th episode. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah. been an incredible journey. Incredible. I mean, every woman's story is so inspiring to me. I take inspiration from every, from every single one of these stories. Every woman that I speak with, there's inspiration there for me. And all the stories are so different and beautiful and incredible. And it's just amazing. I love that I get to do this. Yeah. And you're such a great host. You know, I was on oh, your podcast you. recently and it was just, yeah, it was just such a beautiful experience. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, you are just as gracious a host. So <laughs> I'm, I'm loving this. This is great. This is just natural, free flowing conversation. It's amazing. Yeah. I, it's like, yeah. When people come on my podcast, it's like, we don't know what we're going to talk about. It's just, just like, we'll just oh, go with the flow. Completely like, <laughs> not even on topic of what they do. In yeah. their lives or their career. <laughs> it's just a conversation with friends. And that's what I tell all my guests too is that because some of them are nervous and, you know, just tell them, listen, just look at it as a conversation between two friends. We're chatting over a coffee, a drink, whatever you want to, whatever your beverage is, just think of it as two friends chatting. We're just talking about you. That's all. Yeah. We're having a conversation. Yeah. And I think women especially find it hard to talk about themselves yes. most of the time. Yeah. yeah. I've, um, Absolutely. Because I used to hate talking about myself. I <laughs> hated it. Anytime yeah. is like, yeah, so it's yeah you you make people feel really comfortable and you're so chilled you know you're just like you know so chilled and so calm well, so it's thank easy you. to just be yeah not be nervous on your podcast well, I, think, I think that's our responsibility as hosts is to make the guests feel comfortable I mean this is about them it's not about us as mm, hosts it's about exactly. the guests and sharing their story so I think it's our responsibility to first of all actively listen to what our guests are telling us but also make them feel comfortable because when you're comfortable, it'll come across in the interview. If they're uncomfortable, it will definitely come through and it won't make for a very good interview. So it's important yeah. to make them feel comfortable. Yeah, definitely. Did you have any um, last words of wisdom for our guests that are listening? <laughs> <laughs> I would just say be authentic, step into who you authentically are, be who you are, go after what you want. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do anything. Believe in yourself. That's, that's it. That's the most important thing is believe in who you are. Surround yourself with positive people and enjoy life. We only get one go around at this thing. So mm -hmm. do what makes you happy. That's yeah. it. Definitely great words of wisdom there. Thank you Thank for you. sharing that. Brad, Thank before you. we wrap up, can you share with us one last thing? What's setting your soul on fire at the moment? Oh, this multi-author book I'm working on. I'm, I'm looking yes. for women to contribute to a multi-author book that I'm co-producing. This is what's setting my soul. I'm loving when, when we bring new authors into the book and all the women who are already in the book are congratulating each other and it's just incredible to see the support in the community that women are giving each other. That's what's setting my soul on fire is seeing those women support one another. There is such an amazing thing. It's so beautiful to see women supporting one another. That's, mm. that's what set my soul on fire right now. 
That's beautiful. Yeah. And um, do you want to talk, maybe just give a little sure. um, plug about what, yeah, your book. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The book I'm looking for female authors to contribute. The cutoff date is next Friday, actually a week today, okay. May 13th. <clears throat> Um, it's called transforming pain into purpose, uplifting stories of empowerment. And we're just looking for women who have stories where they've overcome adversity struggles that they've been through and they've come out the other six, the other side, successful and stronger and more empowered and feeling good about themselves. And Mm. so I'm just looking for contributing authors that want to want to write a chapter in this book and be part of this incredibly powerful book with all the other women who are brave enough and courageous enough to stand up and share their story through written word in this book. Beautiful. And when they, when is it likely to be available for people to get July, a copy? It will launch, it will launch, July. It will launch in July. Yep, July awesome. this year. All right. Yeah. We'll keep an eye out for that. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation, Brad. If people want to, you know, find out more about you or how they can, you know, work with you, be on a podcast or have you on their podcast, where should they go? Um, You can find me on Instagram. Instagram is where I usually hang out. Um, Empower at Empowerography Podcast. I have my podcast website, www.empowerographypodcast.com. You can reach out to me through email um, empowerography podcast at gmail.com. I'm always looking for women to be guests on the podcast. So if you're interested in being a guest, send me an email and then we'll hop on a discovery call and chat and look about, look at having you on, on the podcast as a guest. Perfect. I'll have all your details in the show notes so people can Thank reach you. out to you. Thank you so much, Brad. Oh, Kaki is been my absolute honor and pleasure being here such a great wonderful easy flowing conversation with you i am so honored to have been asked to be a guest thank you for having me on your platform to share my story and my journey i appreciate you thank you so much i'm so grateful for our friendship that's you know it's really wonderful so glad to have met you you're a beautiful soul kaki thank you thank you